Welcome to One Mind Zen. Tonight's Dharma talk is given by Myung Jin Un Sun. Thich Nhat Han, when asked about the phrase engaged Buddhism, gave the response, is there any other kind? And that's an interesting point. And the synapses that started clicking and, you know, the little chemicals and electronics and electricity and all that stuff that started pinging around inside uh, my head got me thinking about a number of things. <clears throat> First of all, if there were no dark, right? Like if, if there were no time at which point the sun actually sets, much like in Sweden right now, <clears throat> would we need a word for dark? I mean, if it's always light, then who needs a word for dark, right? We wouldn't need it. Fish probably don't have a word for water on any number of levels. So if there's no other kind of Buddhism other than engaged Buddhism, then we can throw out the phrase engaged Buddhism because it's redundant, it's unnecessary. And then some more synapses started firing and I was thinking to myself, yeah, you know, for a bunch of people that are supposed to be really in on this non-duality thing, we do a pretty lousy job of it sometimes. We have, starting with whenever, at whatever point, the Sangha started moving beyond its original geographical boundaries. Things started getting separated in other ways also. We end up with Mahayana and Hinayana. That's pretty judgmental right there. Hey, we're on the greater path. You guys, the lesser path. And then you go into Tibet and then you got Vajrayana and it's like, yeah, 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 you guys, you're okay, but we're on the diamond path. And then there's more subdivisions and you end up with Chan and then San and then Zen and then Tian and then Zen again once it gets over to the West. And we're still like doing these little chopping moves. And then you get into further subdivisions. Progressive Buddhism, vegan Buddhism. There's probably a few more that I'm not even aware of. And these are all lines that we just arbitrarily set boundaries with. The Lotus Sutra talks of Ekayana, E-K-A Yana. One vehicle. I'm sure that if you went back to the original Sangha, that's probably how they would think of it. It's like there is no other vehicle, so why even bother calling it a vehicle? It's just what we do. 
but then we start categorizing and coming up with all these little interesting uh, subdivisions, most of which are probably used to make one feel superior, or at least one sect to seem superior than others, right? I said, you know, Mahayana, Hinayana thing. Um, I'm sure there are plenty of Tendai practitioners who think that, yeah, well, you know, you Zen guys, you're okay and everything, but yeah, we really got it. We're esoteric, you know. And we continue to do that. Even though, like, right from the get-go, the teachings say, no, 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 no non-duality. Even go beyond non-duality. Even drop the concept of non-duality. But before you're doing that, you know, on the me in the meantime, on your way there, just, you know, go with non-duality. And all these little subdivisions and all this uh, superiority that we attach to our own sect is really just a way to perpetuate the notion of self. I am separate from you. My sect is separate from you. There's all the rest of Buddhism in the world, plus one. And that's my sect. And we're better than any of you. So if not having a permanent self is one of the core teachings and non-duality is one of the core teachings then why do we come up with so many little subdivisions is it just to make ourselves comfortable to give us something to identify with shouldn't need to identify with any of it There is no permanent, solid self. And that applies not only to this bag of flesh that's sitting here flapping its lips right now, but there is no solid, substantial, permanent Zen. There is no permanent, substantial Mahayana. There's no permanent substantial Hinayana. There's no permanent substantial Buddhism. Buddhism itself is a concept. If you go back to the original Sangha again, I don't even think they thought of it as Sangha plus one with the one being the Buddha. It was probably just the Sangha. And they probably didn't even bother calling themselves that. It was probably other people that referred to them that way. If the sun never sets, you don't need a word for dark. If you're in a community of practitioners, you don't need a word for those who aren't part of that community of non-practitioners. When I was first starting to meditate, I was sitting there and I was with a group and, and we sat facing the wall. And one of the first things that I noticed, or 
one of the things I noticed fairly early on, is probably more accurate, was that with my half-open eyes in a darkened room, staring at a wall upon which my shadow was being cast, I really couldn't quite tell where eyelid ended and, you know, sight of wall began. It was really just sort of this gray thing that my eyes were perceiving. And the dividing line between lid and wall was really tough to establish. When, as practitioners, we try and impose that line between lid and wall just to give ourselves some sort of sense of permanence, of self, of identification, we're missing a prime level of practice. We're really missing it if, you know, the vegan Buddhist starts an argument with the omnivore Buddhist. When we put ourselves in competition with each other, another sect, go beyond the walls of the Dharma room and put ourselves in the situation with other people that we might come in contact on any given day. It's the same thing. We're setting ourselves separate, if not from everything else, than individual bits that comprise everything. There is no other kind of Buddhism. And I'm not even going to say what kind that is. Johnson gave us a talk a few months ago, probably now, that was titled, Don't Be a Bodhisattva. Because if you identify as a Bodhisattva, you're separating yourself from the rest of the sentient beings of whom you're supposed to be saving slash helping. Even though the Diamond Sutra says, yeah, there's no dar bodhi <laughs> bodhisattvas, there's no sentient beings, there's no saving to be done. Yeah, we'll gloss over that and just talk about how there's bodhisattvas, and there's sentient beings. The practice is to be that sort of vague, gray, kind of indecipherable melange of gray eyelid and gray wall, where there is really no separation apparent. There is no separation apparent. We don't have to become, we don't have to act like what I have come to call adjective Buddhists, fill in the blank, Buddhist, vegan, omnivore, Democrat, Republican, green, yellow, whatever, before the word Buddhist. The practice needs no adjectives. The practice barely needs a noun. It makes it convenient for us to talk about.
But beyond that, we can pretty much drop it. Like right now, I don't really have to say the word Zen in one of these talks because we're in a situation where we have other Zen practitioners. So, you know, I don't really have to set it aside as something else. It's just I'm talking about things and they happen to be coming from a Zen perspective and it's all good. But we don't need to set aside any other sect or type of Buddhism or practitioner of some other form or practitioner of some other religion or any of those other things because those divisions don't exist. They are characterized by shunyata, emptiness, openness, however you want to refer to that. Their illusion. So, if nothing else, here we are at the end of 2022, moving into the year 2023 in short order. And if nothing else, if we can dedicate ourselves to the idea of dropping adjectives when referring to Buddhism, and then perhaps dropping the adjectives when we move on to other things, that sounds like a pretty good resolution to me. <laughs>